responder network. Right, so the first responder network is actually uh, a network of trained personnel, not, not just the medics or uh, the nurses, but we try as well to train everybody. Because if an emergency should happen, we need everyone, you know, hands on deck. They should be able to attend to that emergency prior to when medical help uh, arrives. Compared to you just taking pictures, just to make a stories on maybe Instagram, Twitter, or, and all of that. So we don't want that to happen. We try as much as possible to uh, make sure that everybody is equipped with basic first aid knowledge. You know, my foundation does not want a situation like a monopoly system of knowledge, whereby this knowledge is restricted to just a group of people. You know, and before we can help, you know, help is something that everybody needs and it's something everybody can offer. It's not something just that maybe a particular profession should offer. So, so my, um, can I get a, all right, so sorry about that. I'm too fast, just let me know. Okay, so how is something anybody and everyone can offer? So um, basically, without wasting much of our time, so we'll be diving into the, the training properly. I'll be sharing my screen for everybody to see and um, what we're doing, so that at least because there are some pictures, some there are some diagrams in there that um, I think everybody, every one of us, need to see, so that we'll be able to relate it easily. Right, I hope everybody can see my screen. So like I said, we're from Trauma Care International Foundation. I also like, I'll talk maybe later on, I'll talk about our app. We also have an app, the TCR user app and the TCR responder app. So basic emergency response training course, practical section. So about TCI, I've said that already. I said we are an NGO with a mandate to improve the state of trauma care and emergency-based response through health education advocacy and community-based program such as child safety awareness, because the children shouldn't be left out in this, at least even if they don't have the, the strength to actually do CPR, but they can actually give an instruction to their um, parents on what to do, you know, and help save the situation, instead of them just looking without knowing what to do. So um, the child safety awareness campaign, awareness, community and first responders training, emotional information, hospital and government program, project. All right, so this is our website for this certificate uh, for free, and these are email address in case you want to message us also. Okay, now um, this the, the next slide here is talking about introduction to the TCI product. Basically, what we do, what we offer. We have mentioned the TCI app, the voluntary blood donation initiative, the child safety awareness campaign, and the impact your community campaign, which each and every one of us can be. And part of, right? Because once we train you, we don't want the situation that we train you, you just go to knowledge without helping people in need of this knowledge. So we want everybody, because this training is coming to you for free, and we want you to be able to also offer this training, especially when you're a passerby and somebody's in need of help, you will be able to you know, provide assist, all right? Okay, learning objective of this training. So at the end of this training, you should know how to recognize and also provide immediate first aid for common emergencies. You know, learn the correct way to evacuate the casualty and know what CPR means and be able to perform it. So fact or not, an emergency is a serious, unexpected and often dangerous situation requiring immediate action. So the aim of this training is to is to produce trained first responders. A trained first responder, a trained first aider can make a difference between life and death for a casualty. All right, so um, we are advised not to move the casualty. All right, you can only move the casualty when it is necessary, especially if it happens, the emergency happens in the middle of the road. That is when we are advised to move the casualty. 
So the simple emergency response plan, I think uh, there are some certain things that I'm going to skip here because I'm still going to talk about it. So instead of wasting our time, um, I think I'll, I'm going to skip some things. So the cross outline. So today, this is, this are, this is, these are some of the things we'll be looking at. All right, so we'll be looking at bleeding, which is nose bleed, nose, nose bleeds, minor and deep cuts. Also, how to care for an unconscious casualty, the recovery position, what is CPR, first aid for choking in infant and adult, first aid for seizures and asthmatic attacks, first aid for bones, and I don't think I'll talk about snake bite. You can actually get that on our slide. Though I can talk about it if time permits, but you can also get it on our slide or uh, at the end of the training, I'm going to introduce the teaser and you can also get all of that there. All right. So now, the question is, what is first aid? Um, our normal routine, once we go out for training, we actually have a pretest, but I wouldn't want to do the pretest now because we're actually doing this training online. All right, so um, I'll just dive into the, the course itself. All right, so what is first aid? On a general basis of knowledge, they will define first aid as the first and quick help given when anyone gets sick or hurt, which is actually correct. But um, Trauma Care International Foundation, you know, so every year, you know, um, a slight changes and it is being updated. Right, first aid is actually the quick and correct response. It's stated here. It is actually the quick and correct response. So a treatment that is quick and is not correct, we don't regard it as first aid. And also a treatment that is correct, all right, and is not quick, it is not first aid, because from the definition, we define first aid as the quick and the correct response. So it must uh, entail the two things, quick and correct, for it to be first aid, all right? So basically, the doctors don't carry out first aid. They actually carry out treatment because it's time to take the patient to get to uh, the emergency facility. You know, that first stability that we are trying to prioritize, you know, must have been elapsed, elapsed. So we don't want that to happen. We are trying to actually buy or uh, prioritize the first 10 minutes, right? Because that is actually the window of opportunity for anybody to get saved, saved during an emergency. So aim of first aid. So there are five P's in first aid, which you really, really need to know. All right, so one is to preserve life. The other is, that is five P's, letter P. The let one, number one is for you to preserve life. The second one is to protect the casualty from harm. The third one is to provide pain relief, to provide the injury, prevent the injury or illness from becoming worse. And the last is to provide reassurance. You have to really, you know, do this to the casualty. Your major purpose is to preserve the life, to protect the casualty from further harm, provide pain relief, to prevent the emergency from becoming worse, and, you know, provide reassurance if need be. So I'm going to skip this part, talking about the first eight keys. So these are some of the things that are found in the first aid box. Right? So I'm going to skip it because of time. I'm going to skip this one also. Okay, from our first topic, okay, I want to talk about how to care for an unconscious person. All right. How to care for an unconscious person. You can see the diagram from this slide. If somebody is unconscious and it is not he's not breathing, he or she is not breathing, you do the recovery position. On the other end, if somebody is unconscious and the person is breathing, is breathing, sorry, I'll come back again. If somebody is unconscious and the person is breathing, you do the recovery position. And if the person is unconscious and is not breathing, you switch over to CPR, all right? So you have to know the difference between these two things, unconscious and not breathing casualty, and unconscious and breathing casualty. Like I said, unconscious and not breathing, you do CPR, unconscious and breathing, you put the person in a recovery position. We are going to demonstrate all of this because we have uh, three mannequins here. So we are going to demonstrate all of this for, for, for you to see. All right, so the primary survey is actually doctors ABC, DRS ABC. So from here, I think I'm going to take my slide off for uh, the main time. Okay, but the primary study is actually doctors ABC. This is a simple acronym that each and every one of us needs to know. 
All right, distance of danger, which is also known as the scene safety. Then arrow stands for response, which are, we are also going to demonstrate all of that for you to see. S is same for help. A is A will be breathing. Then C circulation or probably chest compression and CPR. All right, so um, I'm going to take off my slide now. All right, so that is that about it. Okay, um, for letter D, which I said is danger, if you are in an emergency scene, maybe it happens to be maybe a pacify or it happens when you're there, the first thing first is to look for scene safety because you know what to do. You don't ha have to, you know, just jump close helping the person. You have to make sure that you are safe for yourself and uh, for yourself and also the person because if you are not safe, you can actually help that person. All right, so first thing is same safety, which is danger. So you have to check what happened to the person. Was the person electrocuted? If not so, check if they happen to be maybe like water splash on the floor, he slipped and fell, maybe hitting, the, hitting his head or something like that. So you have to check for scene safety. Maybe after observing and you check around for the scene safety and everywhere is safe, that is when you have to proceed to the next letter, which is arrow, letter arrow, which is actually calling for response. All right, so letter R is the response. So how do you call for response? There are different ways we call for response, all right? So for an adult, we call for response by tapping on both shoulders. So I'm going to demonstrate that shortly, all right? We call for response by tapping on both shoulders and call into both ears, all right? You don't necessarily have to know, know their names, all right? You can call on the ears. Either, hello, sir, can you hear me? Hello, sir, can you hear me? Or if you know their name is sign, why for a baby or an infant, you tap them on their foot? All right, so I'm going to demonstrate that for you for a baby, because. All right, so this is my uh, infant mannequin. I hope you can see it. No. Okay, I think I need to, instead of the sign, I wanted to call somebody to demonstrate this for me, but let me just do this up here. All right. For a baby, because I'm holding this, you, you're not, I'm not supposed to be holding this like this. Okay, I think I should just call her. Please call my sister again. Yeah. I think you need to make one for For a baby, just show how to call for a restaurant for a baby. Okay, so it is one of the most sensitive parts of your body. Just, just give it a minute. All right, so for a baby, you place them uh, on a flat surface. All right, you're not supposed to carry them. I'm just doing this because I just want to demonstrate. So you tickle them under the foot. All right, so you know, for you as an adult, if I should touch you under your foot, you see, you feel the sensation. So this is one of the most sensitive parts their body at this stage. So you tickle them on the other foot and they'll be able to respond if they are conscious, all right? But if they are not conscious, they will not respond to you. That is for an infant. So an infant is um, from age one downward, zero to one, all right? So that is an infant. So you tickle them on the other foot. If they are um, active, they'll respond to you, all right? Why, why an adult, I said, you tap them on both shoulders and call on both ears, all right? So the next thing is, I've called out for response. So the next thing is what? S in our acronym. So I'll repeat, I'll repeat the acronym today. I said we have D, R, S, A, B, C. D is for danger, R for response, S for send for help, A for hope, the airway, B breathing, then C chest compression. So I've done D, which is, which is danger and scene safety. I've done response by tapping on the person's shoulder and calling about on both ears. So for so the next thing I have to do is to um, um, send for help. And how do you send for help? If you happen to be in an office setting, you have the 
uh, your alarming system, just do it activity or shout for help. If you have somebody maybe close by, maybe in the next office, they come, tell them what to do. You have to give them a precise, uh, uh, you have to tell them what happened, all right? And tell them to call the emergency number. And not just tell, talk, you don't have to ask them to call the emergency number without giving them the emergency number. You have to tell them the emergency number because most of the time, when we go out of training and we ask people, what is the emergency number? They'll tell us one or two. All right, so we are not in Washington or maybe US or something like that. We're in Nigeria. So the emergency number for, uh, for Nigeria is one or two. Why that of Lagos State? Because I'm in Lagos. So that of Lagos State here in Lagos, it is 767. But for Nigeria, it's one or two. They are working, so you can also call them. But we also have an app called the TCR app that you can use to call for help, which I'm going to introduce later to you the emergency response app that you can actually use to call for help. So that is that for that. You call, once you call the emergency number, either one or two, you tell them the exact location, all right? You have to give them a specific address with, where it happened, all right? You cannot just tell them or give them um, uh, an address that would be difficult for them to locate. So if, if possible, give them the number, the number of the house and everything, and the closest bus stop, all right? Just let them know so that they'll be able to locate the emergency scene, all right? So that is that for letter S. And the next letter is A, which is for you to open the airway, all right? So most of the time, if somebody is in an emergency and is lying down first up, you know, our tongue is actually a big organ that can roll back and block our airway. I think I need to show the slide for this, but let me just explain it and I'll show you the slide for this. So it's a big organ that, that can actually roll back and block our airway and we find it difficult to breathe. So what do you do? Right, you have to do what we call the head tilt chin lift maneuver. Head head tilt chin lift maneuver. All right, by placing the four, I'm going to demonstrate that also for you. By placing, I'm going to run this thing again. I'm just trying to explain for you to get an idea. All right, so the head tilt chin lift maneuver. So it is done by placing your palm on the person's forehead while using your two finger on the person's chin. You tilt the head backward. By doing so, you create a space for air to pass. All right, like because if the person is lying down like that, the tongue roll back and blocks the person's airway. And you no, know, most of the time in an emergency, the person will still be alive. But because you don't open the airway, you will assume that the person is dead. Meanwhile, the person is still very much alive. So we don't want this to happen. We try as much as possible, you know, to check for every and any possible sign, you know. So that is that. All right, let me try. Let me share my screen to show you the slides. How it looks like. Okay, actually, this is what they are doing. From here, you can see the picture. This is the healthy chin lift maneuver. All right, so your palm will be on the person's forehead. Why your other two figure on the person's chin? Then you feel the head backward. All right. So um, this is the S-ray view of it. From the S-ray view, you can see from this particular from the first diagram, the the windpipe there is very is blocked. The airway is blocked. It's very narrow, so air cannot easily penetrate. All right. But once you do the uh, help to change it maneuver, you can see the windpipe the, the the airway there is now open. For air to pass so the person will be able to breathe all right so once you do this the person will have that space to breathe but if you do this and the person is still not breathing what are you supposed to do once you do this you also have to check out if the person is once you open the airway you bring sorry i didn't mention something the b aspect of it let me see if i have this slide here okay this is the b aspect of it the next slide check for breathing a is airway, which is this particular slide. Then the next one is B, which is you bringing your cheek close to the person's nose to observe if the person is still breathing. You know, if the person is breathing, you feel this warm air coming out from the person's nose tree. But if the person is not breathing, you always know. All right. For uh, if a lay first aider, we don't teach them how to check for pulse. All right, because most of the time, if you're checking for pulse, you'll be feeling your own pulse, thinking it's the person's pulse. All right, so because um, because of the person, maybe in that mood, you'll be panicking and all of that. We try as much as possible not to teach them about the pulse, but if you want to check for pulse, 
You can as well use your two finger to place on the person's trigger, right, by the side of the truth. Just place your two fingers there. You feel, okay, I'm going to show you with my own self, because I know you can, okay, you can see me. So you place your two fingers on the person, uh, on the side of the street, all right? If the person is still alive, you feel the pulse, all right? But if he's not alive, or if he's not breathing, sorry, if the person is not breathing, you won't feel the pulse. And mind you, if somebody's gasping, we don't regard it as um, breathing. If somebody's gasping as if you want to, like, it's sipping air, all right? We don't regard it as a... Uh, as, as, as though the person is responsive, all right? So you have to do superior also for such casualty. All right, so you check for bread for 10 seconds, lest I forget, all right? You check for bread for 10 seconds. You know, this process is actually very, very fast. The whole of this process, says, um, from D to letter C, is actually for 10 minutes, all right? You have to do it for 10 minutes. So you have to be very fast. By checking for danger, checking for response, sending for help, checking if the person is still breathing, opening the airway and doing CPR, it has to be for 10 minutes. So you have to be very fast. And I'll tell you why I said it, it has to be for 10 minutes. All right, so that's that. Um, for that, let me take off the slide again. Okay, uh, the reason why you have to check, you have to do this for 10 minutes because uh, most of the time, uh, okay, let me just put it this way, shortage, shortage of oxy oxygenated blood going to the brain, within the space of um, five, six to seven minutes, some of the brain cells will start dying. And 10 minutes and above, some of those dead cells become irreversible. All right, 10 minutes and above, 10, 15 minutes and above, some of those dead cells become irreversible. And even if they recover, they will develop a complication. So you don't want that to happen. So you have to pay into that time, making sure that the person receives enough amount of um, oxygen in the brain and the various organs of the body within that space of that emergency. That is why I said earlier on that doctors don't actually perform first aid. They are more of treatment. So if first aid is the person, the first person that will respond to that emergency and buy time for the medical personnel to actually help that person in an emergency. All right, so that is the work of the first aid. Okay, so that is that for that. Um, for adult CPR, okay, CPR actually stands for cardiopulmonary resuscitation. For those that don't know, C is for cardio, C stands for cardio, P stands for pulmonary, and R stands for resuscitation. All right, so um, cardio is actually referring to the heart, uh, pulmonary referring to the lungs, while resuscitation means to revive. All right, so um, you have to help the heart. You know, when the person is unconscious and not responding, the heart has stopped, you know, has stopped pumping out blood. So what is your work? All right, your work is to form like a pseudo heart, like a false heart, by compressing the heart to pump out blood to the various organs of the body. Because as at that point, the heart has actually stopped pumping out blood, which is not good for the person. Because even if the person will survive, as long as it's not getting this blood, oxygenated blood to the brain and the various organs of the body, especially to the brain, the present chances of survival is, has been reduced. So you don't want that to happen. You have to help pump, do the chest compression to pump this blood to the various organs of the body. And what is the ratio of compression to, to, to brain? All right. You have to compress a person's chest 30 times and you give out rescue breath twice. I repeat, you have to compress the person's chest 30 times and you give out two rescue breath. We are going to demonstrate all of, all of that, but I just want to, you know, take the theory and then once you're doing the practical, we'll just run through. Okay, so you compress the person's chest 30 times, you give two rescue breath, and you deliver each breath in a second, all right? You don't have to load in for um, a long time because if you pump in so much air, you can cause what we call um, gastric inflammation. So you don't want that to happen. Just deliver each breath in a second. All right, but what if in a situation whereby you don't know the person and you don't want to give rescue breath? You're not comfortable, the person's mouth is not okay with you. You're not okay putting your mouth in the person's mouth because of uh, 
Maybe I don't know what is coming up on the process. I don't know what to blow all of that because it is not ideal for you to come contact with someone alone, and you're not comfortable doing that. So what you're supposed to do is do hundred chest compression to one twenty without doing in a minute actually without having to do the without having to give the the rescue break. All right. So hundred chest compression to one twenty in a minute without having. So it is exhausting. It's tiring. So that is why. At the initial, you have to call for help. And mind you, you don't call for help without, you must, before you call for help, you must confirm that the person is not responding. You don't call for help without confirming that. So you have to confirm that this person is not responding. All right? So once you call for help, you go ahead. And you don't call for help and wait. You have to call for help and you don't proceed towards stopping that person um, survive. All right, so that is that. For that, but we have devices that you can use. We have the, the nose mask or shield the, that you can actually use to put in, on the person's mouth, which I'm going to show you the time, all right, to help that person in case, you're, in case you want to be prescriptive. And the next thing is, which is the CPR, the last part, C. I thought I've, I've talked about B. The last one is C, chest compression. And for you to give chest compression, the hand placement is also, it differs for different individuals. For an adult, you can see the first picture here. For an adult, you interlock your hand and, I don't know if you can see me, I think there's so. An adult, you have to interlock your hand, all right? You interlock your hand like this, and you place your hand, the bridge of your hand, this hard aspect of your hand, on the middle of the chest, in between the little point, all right? So you draw, to, for you to locate the middle point, for a story for you guys, it's a lot easier. You draw an imaginary line down the throat and across the nipple, which I'm going to show you using my manifold. So you draw an imaginary line down the throat, across the nipple. You do the chest, that is where you to place your hand, and you do the chest compression. All right, for an adult, uh, you have to go as deep as five centimeters. For an adult, you place, that is for an adult, sorry. Then for a child, you have to use just one hand. All right, also, the heel of your hand, this part, that aspect of it, you place it on the middle of the chest and you do the compression 30 times to respirate. You're comfortable to do the respirate. While for a child, either you use two fingers or you do what we call the double thumb and second fingers, which I'm going to show you shortly. So for me, I prefer using the double thumb and second techniques because it actually covers a larger surface area compared to when you are doing using the double thumb, especially for ladies that are this. Nails, it is very, very difficult for them to use that method because their nails can actually pierce through the baby's chest. But if you're using the double thumb and cycling for this, you're actually using the tongue to compress on the baby's chest, which is very much better than using the double arm, using two fingers. All right, let me see if I have the pictures to show. This is for a child. You see, he's using one hand. You don't necessarily have to place your hand on the person's head, but just his own hand and compress. While for an infant, you can see from the picture slide here, is using just two fingers on the baby's chest. All right, so I'm going to demonstrate that now. I think I'm done with the CPR aspect of this. So let me just, okay, this is a barrier device that you can use to, uh, that you can use uh, to do the demonstration. It's your compatible giving the rescue bread. So I'm going to take down my slide now. Okay, behind me is a mannequin, but um, I don't know because of the distance from my screen to so that mannequin, I think it's a bit far. So I'm going to use a table to demonstrate this and I'll also explain why I'm supposed to use table. All right. Okay, so I'm going to use this one here. So this is just for demonstration purposes, all right? You're not supposed to. All right, um, this is just for demonstration purposes, like I said. You're not supposed to do chest compression like this, all right? So 
on the norms are supposed to for babies is okay you can do it on an elevated surface like this but for uh like a but for an adult it is best to do it on the floor or hard surface all right instead of you doing it on um maybe on the table but it is also not advisable to do it on the bed don't so watch movies and see people do it on the bed even the medical practitioners it is not on the best idea reason being that once you are compressing it then it will also be taken from because it is soft your compression will not be that effective all right so but if you want your compression to be effective you have to do it on a flat hard surface that will not be taken from all right so i'm going to run through the process again like i said from for those just joining i'm going to run through the process again from drs abc illustrating with learning things all right so for the first thing first maybe i'm just a passer by and um, people like um, somebody pull out and people are gathered all about this person so the first thing is for me to help you know because i know what to do you have to be confident you have to be good on what you're doing right don't just go there um acting panicked or showing sign of uh, afraid not knowing what to do so you have to be confident letting everybody know that okay you're in charge you know what to do all right so the first thing first is for you to approach emergency scene if it's being crowded you have to ask them to you know create space for ventilation all right so you can ask what happens so that you have an idea okay so the next thing maybe for example i've fixed um i've checked your sensitivity and it is safe because it's an out or something all right it is safe so the next thing is for me to call for response and how do you call for response i'll remind you again like i said so they're not supposed to do it here maybe on the ground or hard flat surface but should be something low so that you not um, you know, enjoy yourself so the next thing is for me to call for response and how do you call for response like i said an adult you call for response by tapping on both shoulders and when you tap on both shoulders you call on both ears all right if you don't know his name or her name all right can you, hey, sir. Hello, sir. Can you hear me hello sir you know like i said this process is very fast it's just a 10 minutes you don't have to push the person or you can the person all right don't raise the person's or especially if it happens to be like a maybe let me say a um, accident accident case and you are trying to raise the person you don't know if the person has sustained a uh, a spinal injury. Once you're trying to raise a person, you can, you know, worsen it. You don't want that to happen. Just start on the person's shoulder. Even hard, all right? Just start on the person's shoulder, hard, and call on both ears. The reason why you're calling on both ears, just to be sure that the person is not really partially dead on one of the ears. And you have to call on both ears just to be sure. All right? So the next thing is, I've called for, I've tapped on the shoulder and call on both ears. So the next thing is for me to send for help. So I can shout, help, help, help. And somebody comes. I just give the person instruction. Okay, call the emergency number one one two. Tell them we are at number so and so. Blah 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 blah. Let me also move the head. It's on its way. Or maybe I don't have somebody there. I'm the only one. That doesn't mean that I can call for help. I can use my phone and that emergency number put it on speaker. Then tell the person what to do. So what is the next thing you're supposed to do? All right. I've called for help. The next thing is to check if the person is breathing. I mind you, maybe when you uh, come to the emergency scene, the person is putting on shoes, tie, and all of that. You have to lose it, you know, to give the person that freedom, that space to breathe, and all of that. All right, so you create that space for the person. So, what is the next thing? Sorry. Okay, so sorry about that. Uh, sorry about that. So the next thing is uh, for you to have she called for response. So the next thing is for me to open the airway. And how do you open the airway? Like I said, the palm on the person's forehead. You don't have to close their eyes. The palm on the person's forehead. The two fingers on the person's chin. You till the head backward. You have to till the head backward. From the slide that I show you, the air review, you can see that once you till the head backward, you create that space. The air will be open for air to pass through right so you till the head backward and the next letter is letter b which is bringing your cheek to the person's nose way close to the person's nose way. and you observe the stomach region or the chest if it's rising and falling all right you don't do it do it this way because doing it like this you're not observing the person's stomach all right so you have to be in this direction observe 
the head still remains tilted, all right? So it's not as if you want to check your breathing, you lick the head. So the head still remains tilted. You observe the stomach region. It is rising and falling. That is why for ladies, if you have a weak one, you have to be that tight and do something to it, all right? So you observe it for 10 seconds, all right? For 10 seconds, if the person is still breathing. But what if the person is not breathing? The next thing you have to do is to initiate CPR, all right? So how do you do CPR? For you to do CPR, you have to expose the chest. You don't do CPR uh, on, on a specific glue. You have to expose the chest so that you're able to locate the midpoint in between the two nipples, right? So even for a lady, you have to expose the chest, but if you're doing that, try to do it with dignity, all right? So I'm going to expose the, the, the chest of the mannequin. All right, so you draw an imaginary line down the throat. Should I stand this? Okay. So you draw an imaginary line down the throat and across the two nipple. All right, so that is what you're supposed to do. Draw an imaginary line down the throat across the two nipple. Okay. The midpoint of it, which is here, that's where you're going to place your hand. But for ladies that are in doubt, um, you don't know where to place your head, all right? Uh, at the end of the stem of the breastbone, all right, just take your hands a meter upward to be able to find, get the location, all right? All right, so for an adult, I've located my midpoint. I'm going to place my nose there. I mean, I'm trying to use neural that service. I'm not going to mount so much of the pressure here so that I want. Okay, I think my colleague will do it to help me now, but you can see she will use the, the mannequin now to do that demonstration. All right, but I just want to show you how to place your hand there. So you place your hand and you have to be on above your mannequin. You don't have to stay so far from it like this. You have to be on top of your mannequin. Then you compare and you interlock your hand. Your hand shouldn't, shouldn't be flexed like this because if your hand is flexed, it's as if you're using your 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 power or your muscle power to compress. But I don't want you to use your muscle power, you have to use your, your body power to compress. So you bring your mannequin and compress them on the stage of it. All right, so she's going to demonstrate that for us to see. All right, so um, I hope you can see her from there. So you're using the adult mannequin, just put it in the middle. All right. So she exposed, exposes the chest of the mannequin. All right, so have you um, tried to locate the midpoint of the chest for them to see? All right, so that's the midpoint. Just play with us because of the distance. But I'll show you how to look at the, the, the midpoint from my own mannequin here. So with that, uh, place, do your hand placement on the chest. So that is what she's doing. She interlocked her hand and she placed it. As you can see her from a distance, uh, joint is not flexed, all right? So, okay, I think I need to move. It's, it's straight, all right? And she's above her mannequin. Okay, I don't really wrong with her. Try to move her body. As you can see, if she's been maybe leaning backward, it's actually wrong. So she has to lean forward and you know straighten herself with her uh, joint also straight. And right, so I'm going to come on to test it for her. Then I will demonstrate the rescue break from my own mannequin here. Yeah. In case you're comfortable keeping the rescue break. So just watch or uh, just listen to my count. If you don't know how to count it, you can use uh, a simple test that we use. Either I use one, one thousand, two, one thousand in every one, so that's really compressed. The one thousand is just for you to take, uh, for you to relax a bit. One, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand. So in every one thousand, you release the compression. But in every number you're counting, that is when you push in. All right. So I'm going to count for her. Thirty. Then I'll demonstrate how to give the rest of it. So are we ready? Okay. One, two, ready, go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thirty. Thank you so very much. All right, you can see 
her pace was not that too fast and still not slow. All right. So you don't have to do so bring like bring back a mannequin. You don't have to do <laughs> no, it is not ideal. You know, I have beat at a reading. One, two, three, four, five. So you have to follow that rhythm. You don't have to be too fast, like I said, and you don't have also to be too slow. So you have to follow the rhythm of your heart and while you're compressing, all right. So one, I don't want to compress this thing because I'm using a robot table here. All right, so that is that. But if after doing the 30 chest compression, but if you don't want to do the 30 chest one, you don't want to do rescue breath, just continue till you get to 100 to 100 and 120. Then you come back again to 100. You know, once you're doing it in a repeated cycle, you get tired. All right, you don't want that to happen. That is why you have to call for help. But if you're comfortable giving the rescue breath, um, I'll show you how to raise my so I'm looking for something. Okay, so if you want to give rescue bread, I just want to demonstrate how to give rescue bread. If I'm using the the back mask, which is this, all right, this the other device, sorry, but I know that we cannot be working on the street with this device on us. All right, so you can also use what we call the nose. Uh, with this, you can also you can I think we have another one here. The pocket mask, all right. Something you can also use. This one is simple and good. So I'm going to show you that one in a moment. All right, but if you don't have all of these devices with you and you want to still be pressed to bread, all right. Uh, I will explain how to do it, but first of all, I just want to sterilize. This is an alcohol wipe, so I just want to sterilize my mannequin. I just want to demonstrate that how to do it. I'll sterilize the mannequin because if you're using it for training, it's a training mannequin. I don't want to put it in the mouth or everything. So I have to sterilize it to use it. All right. So this is the second one. The um the pocket mask. All right. So this is it. It is designed in such a way that uh you can actually blow air into the person, but the person cannot, you know, exhale anything to you. All right. So it has just one vibe, valve that can take in air inside. But the person, maybe the person has vomit or blood, and the person is coughing them out, cannot really actually take them out to your mouth. Right. So that is how this device is designed to just one way valve. It's not a boot and two way thing. All right. So just for you to open it. From this other end, you you know, it's starting in the person's mouth. You close everywhere. Then you can blow the chest with show you rice and uh, rice and drop. All right. But I want to show you in case you don't have this device. This is with you. So let me sterilize my wipe the, the surface of my mannequin. All right. So. All right, so this is an alcohol wipe that you can also use. All right, so for you to maybe after giving the test chest compression, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, two, thirty. The next thing you have to do is to you know do the chest, the uh, rescue breath. And for you to do your rescue breath, this time around the technique is a bit different um, from when you're opening the airway. So this time around, your palm will still be on the person's forehead, but this time around, your two index finger. You close the person's nose because if you don't close the nose, way, once you are going into the person's mouth, the, the air will be coming out from the person's uh, nose. All right, so you don't want that to happen. And your two fingers on the person's chin, and this time around again, your tongue you opens the person's mouth wide open, and you give the person two quick short breaths. All right, you can observe, you see the, the stomach of this mannequin will rise and fall. All right, so. So you tilt the head backwards, I open the mouth. You see, you give two quick shots, right? You don't have to prolong your breath, right? Two quick shots, I don't know if you observe that the mannequin, the stomach of this mannequin actually rise and drop down, right? So that is what you do for an adult. But what if it happened to be an infant? What are you supposed to do? I also demonstrate that for you to see. Okay, so this is my infant mannequin. 
So I'll take out my adult now. So this is my ink heart mannequin. I hope you can see it. So I found ink heart mannequin. If you want to do chest compression, it is different from when you are doing chest compression for an adult, like I said earlier. All right, for ink heart mannequin, it doesn't use two fingers on the person's uh, chest and you compress 30 times also. But for an infant, you can go as deep as four centimeters. No, for an adult, you, are, you went as fast um, five centimeters, all right? For an infant, because the rib cage, even for a, a child, is five centimeters, but that is why you're using just one hand. I'm, I think I'm going to demonstrate that also. But for an infant, use two fingers. You compress 30 times, but if you're not comfortable using your two fingers, you can use the double tone cycling techniques, all right, by doing this. I don't know if you can see me. All right, so it's as if you, are, you want to carry the baby, but you're not carrying the baby. Why your double tongue will be on the baby's chest? Okay, let me raise it up for you to see me. All right, so it's as if you want to carry the baby, but I'm not, I, you don't have to carry the baby on you. Real emergency scene, all right, just do as if you want to carry the baby, but your tongue on the baby's chest. And you compress on the baby's chest. You know, this is actually very, very uh, good because it is actually covering the larger surface area of the baby's chest, comparing to the metal plane, I just use two fingers on the baby's chest. All right, so I do this on a flat surface, elevated surface for an infant. Why can't I do it on the ground? All right, so I go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, till I get to um, 30, then I do give the rescue bread. Okay, because I'm using an American Heart Association curriculum, they'll tell me to go 30 times to rescue bread. But um, Australian uh, paramedic student, Sometimes back, they're using um, the Australian Heart Association, right? So for them, they, they ask them to do 30, 15 chest compression to rescue them. They are both correct. So in case you uh, encounter such and they ask you to do 15 to rescue them, they are also, it's also correct. Right? So you can do 30 or do two, uh, 30 or do 15 chest compression. Okay, if you want to give rescue bread for an infant, it's also different when you're doing it for a child or an adult. All right, for an infant, because the surface area of the nose is small, you don't have to do chest compression, uh, you don't have to cover the nose, nose ring. So what you need to do is to just tilt the head backwards with your two fingers on the chin, then use your mouth to cover both the nose and the mouth. Then you blow, give two quick short breaths. You know, their, their um, lungs is not that developed, so you don't have to blow too hard, all right? So you just blow and, you know, so the reason why you're blowing in that head, you have to dig it. Like I said, the system is not working. So you have to, you know, help the heart pump blood and also send in some air for the blood to get some air oxygen so they can distribute the various organs of the body. All right, so that is that for an um, infant. Okay, uh, I'd like to show you how to use a bag glass in case you have one and you want to use this. Okay, this is the device I'm talking about. So you have this and you want to use this particular device. All right, so. Can see it has um you see so this part of it that is like V, you place it on um, the nose part, all right, the nose ring, while this down part will be on the mouth or the chin. All right, so but you have to see the head backward. You do what we call the EC method. And say see no EC, all right, whereby these three fingers will help elevate the chain, the person's head, where the C will be on this device like this. All right, so I don't know, but something like this will be on the device, all right, to, you know, actually mount it on the person's face, while the E part will help, you know, tilt the head upwards. All right, so as you can see, okay, I should move to this side. All right, so uh, I'll place this here on the person's nose ring. All right, so I'm forming my C on this device like this. Then my E fingers, you can see it here. I'll put it on the person's chin. Then I'll uh, tilt it upward. All right, with your other hand, you can compress twice. All right, so if you have, like, because I'm the only one here, like a single rescuer, if you have like a multi rescuer or two or three of you, you can as well. One person can go here while the other person compress. All right, because I'm the only one here for now. That is why I'm forming a C, then with my E and three fingers forming E, tilt the head backward, then you compress. You have to tilt the head backward because if you don't tilt, 
even if you try to force air inside this casualty, you will not go because the airway is blocked. So you have to open the airway before you penetrate. All right. So let's not forget if maybe you want to think of course, the person is the person person, you are not you're not able to think of course, you have to do chest compression. If the person is gasping for breath, you also have to do chest compression. All right, so that is that for that. Uh, maybe after chest compression, if you have your AED device, I'm going to show you how to use the AED device for both infants, infant and an adult or a child as well. All right, so maybe you have your AED devices or device with you. I'm going to demonstrate that now. Okay, this is actually a training AED, right? So it's not like a real one. So this is a training AED that you can use, but I just want to show you how to the part placement. And um, because it's an, uh, an automatic AED device, it will give you an, a prompt, an instruction on what to do. You don't have to do it manually, all right? They'll tell you when to, maybe especially when you're compressing, they'll tell you when to, you know, stay clear from the mannequin or your casualty because they want to. Um, deliver, you want to deliver a shock, then you can deliver a shock. So, especially, you know, what, the only time the AD can deliver a shock is when the the AD observes that the heart is beating at heart, an abnormal reading. All right, so it has to bring back the reading uh, of the heart back to normal. All right, so I'm going to place my part. Right, so, so these are the parts. Um, from the part, you can see the instruction on this particular one. The axis, the axis needs to place it on the chest. All right, so um, I think I'm like this in my right chest. The axis need to place it on the right chest. While this particular one, the axis needs to place it uh, by the side of the person. All right, so, uh, so I place this one on the chest. And uh, maybe if the person is hairy, you have to make sure you clean that place because the part will not be able to go, right? I don't want to move, remove the sticky part of it. That's the sticky part here. If I should remove it, it will stick. Since the training mannequin, I'm not going to remove the sticky parts of it. So I'm just going to leave it like that for now. While the other parts will be at the sides, somewhere here. And you can see, but it will just be at the side. So, the other part of the other side, why one will be here. So it's just for you to, if you are still doing your CPR, you just going to activate the AD device. I'm going to put it on now. I don't know if you're going to hear the prompt. Training scenario. All right. So why doing your CPR? Just heart rate doesn't do All right. So, the okay, it has given me a prompt not to touch the patient, patient now. I think I'm going to start it again and put it close to the mouth. So to touch the patient. So he's giving me a problem not to touch a patient that he wants to make a shock. shock so at this point, you have to stick with the patient because if you touch the patient, you're going to get a little bit of also. Right? So you don't want that to happen. Just try as much as possible to stick clear from the patient. See, so when it advises you to continue with the CPR, then you can continue. Now it has actually delivered a shock. So he's giving me a problem and to deliver a shock is just for me to continue my CPR by completing the chest till you get observed that I'm not already in the only time, you know, deliver another shock, right? So that is it for an adult. It is, it is very simple to use in the device. You just follow the prompt and you'll be good, you're good, right? But for a child, all right, especially if you're using an adult um, AV device, for a child, you have to place one at the middle of the chest. And one at the back, all right. So place one at the middle. It's still the same thing. You see the same prompt and everything. But just place one at the middle of the chest and the other at the back. Then follow the prompt. They will ask you to deliver a shock. Just for you to press the button. Once you deliver a shock, then you will continue with your CPR. All right. So that is that for AD. Uh, device so thank you so very much this is the first lesson which is talking about how to take care of somebody that is unconscious 
and not breathing. So this is what you do for somebody that is unconscious and not breathing. So the next thing is how to take care of somebody that is unconscious and breathing. What do you do? I'm unconscious and I'm breathing, all right? So that particular one who needs uh, a life, not a mannequin, maybe a life person, um, is it? Right, um, you're not supposed to do CPR on somebody that is unconscious and breathing. Actually, somebody that is breathing, you're not supposed to. It's not advisable to do CPR on somebody that is still breathing. Because if you should do CPR on somebody that is breathing, it doesn't put the person to, or the person will have cardiac arrest. Using the, uh, you're trying to, you know, change the heart rhythm of that person, all right, the heartbeat of that person. So you don't want that to happen. As long as the person is still breathing, don't do CPR. Or probably why you are doing CPR, and the person, the person is show sign of life, you have to stop CPR. Because if you should continue CPR, you either kill that person again. Right, so as long as the person is showing sign of life, stop CPR and sorry, it's progressing to the recovery position. All right, or maybe while you're doing CPR, uh, the professional have no at initial, you call for help, and the professional helps arrive. Right? You have to also stop CPR, all right, then hand it over to them. And then another reason why you should stop CPR, maybe if you are tired, why do you CPR? You also have to stop, then the professional help can you know, take over from. From the, because you're tired, we don't want the situation whereby you're doing CPR and you and the person are, are in danger. All right, so you have to stop. If the, if the place become unsafe, the people around, especially maybe dealing with Muslim, and you know, you're not supposed to you know, take off your job on and stuff like that. And though you're trying to help the person, but because it is not ideal because of the environment that you are, you actually have to stop. All right, it is not, but you can teach. Uh, maybe if they have their brothers or sisters, they can teach them what to do and they'll be able to, you know, help save the baby. Okay, for the recovery position, like I said, it is just for those that are unconscious and breathing. They are unconscious, but they are breathing. The first one we just did was unconscious and not breathing. Now, for those that are unconscious and breathing, you put them in a recovery position. It's so short, so I'm not going to run through the whole acronym again. So it is just, it is DRS, ABC. Then, for unconscious, that is for unconscious and not breathing. But for unconscious and breathing, it is DRS, ABR. The last letter will change to R. Instead of doing letter C, it changed to letter R. All right, so the R stands for recovery position. So first thing first, to check for danger. They are no danger. You check for response, the person is not responding. You move to send for help. After sending for help, you move to check for airway. Once you're done with that, uh, do, once you're done with that, um, Check for breathing, you will observe that the person is breathing. You do what we call the recovery position, which my colleague is going to demonstrate right away. So um, I'm going to call on how to do that demonstration because I'm going to do it on the live movement. So she's going to do that for me. Erica. Recovery position. She's going to demonstrate the recovery position now with the brother here, right? She's so going to lie down on the floor so that he can actually demonstrate the recovery position. So, because this is an emergency, maybe he's lying down like this. So, she has to turn the person the other way around. All right, so it happens like that. So, maybe if you happen to be the only person there, Especially if you happen to be in maybe an emergency scene and the person has sustained a fracture, uh, fracture maybe in the spinal or anywhere, it will be difficult for just to turn or flip the person. But you have to try, right? So you have to make sure the person is facing up for you to initiate the, the for you to be able to do the recovery position. Right. So she needs to try as much as possible to turn the person. All right. All right. So 
Just can I, can I see her? Right, so let me switch this. Okay, so let me see. This is the casual line. I think just move backward. Okay, let's just assume it's because right now it's too far from the pressures. Can you just move backward? We are conscious in me. No, just leave it now. <laughs> All right, let's assume. So, for you to do the recovery position, you have to rearrange the person. Maybe his hand is scattered everywhere. You have to, you know, arrange the person, keep it at 90 degrees, the other hand, then, you know, you interlock with one of the hands. All right. So, once you interlock, you take that hand to the cheek and don't remove it there. All right. So, you leave the hand at this person's cheek. All right. Then the next thing is to, you know, at the uh, knee joint, you pick from there and you flex the leg, right? Then you move backward, then you can turn the person. You can see what she's doing. All right, so that is actually a recovery position. So I want her to do it again. All right, so first thing first, you move the other hand to one side, then with your, depending on the hand, with your other hand, you interlock and take it to the person's, the side of the person's face, face, all right? So I think you should bring the two legs together. So you bring the two legs together, and from the knee joint, flex the, the leg, one of the leg. You don't pick from inside, you pick from outside. Okay, you can show them how to, maybe the wrong way, how to pick from inside, you see? Picking from inside is wrong, so you pick from outside. So what if the person is um, fat, maybe is big, bigger than you, you don't have the, the power to actually be the person's leg. You can pick from the person's trouser. All right, it is a lot easier. As long as the person is unconscious, the person's leg will flex easily because he's unconscious. So the next thing is for you to move back up to the then you flip the person. No matter the person's size, the person will always flip. Right? Then you adjust the person's shoulder also. So you will not flip back. Adjust the shoulder, yes, push it down. Then you also uh, tilt the leg backwards again to open the airway even in the recovery position. Because if you don't open the airway in the recovery position, the airway will still be blocked and the person will, will go unconscious again. So you don't want that to happen, still open the airway. Then from time to time, use your two finger, take the, your two finger to the person's nose to observe if he's still breathing. But at the point in time, if you observe, at any point in time, if you observe that the person is not breathing, then you push the person back and initiate CPR again. So I see that is it. But mind you, this, uh, Patient is still breathing. We don't have to do CPR because it's still breathing. We don't want to kill him. All right. Thank you so very much for that. Yeah. Okay. So that is it about um, the recovery position. I think I have this slide. Let me show you so so that you have a clue about what I'm talking about. Um, let me share my slides so that you can see what I'm talking about. Okay, this is actually a recovery position. You can see it from the, the, the slides. So you have to bring the person's hand to the person's jaw, right then, or cheek, then the other hand. She picks from outside, not inside. They move backward. At the other picture, you see that, okay, the person is kept in that um, position. So that is actually the recovery position. Then the head is tilted backward. So for a baby, you can also put the baby in your recovery position. This is just a simple way to put the baby in your recovery position. You tilt the baby like this, slightly downward. Then try to make sure that your hand, your hand is not closing the baby's nose or the baby's face is not on your stomach because it does. Um, you will not be able to breathe properly and, and suffocate the baby. All right. I think I just need to demonstrate that quickly, but that is just a picture of it, how to demonstrate that. All right, so slightly, then use your hand to support the baby's head. And you can see, me. this is just basically it's, um, okay, so this is basically it. So your arm in between the baby's leg, you know, support the baby. Then tilt the baby a little bit, bit downward, or right, the head should be a little bit downward. Then you tilt the baby head backwards. 
All right, so it's you, the baby head that I hold the baby for some time. All right, so the baby will be able to gain consciousness. That is it, so on how to put a baby in the recovery for the shop. All right, um, okay, um, for my slide, let me see the next topic. Okay, this is talking about secondary survey. Okay, after carrying out the primary survey and taking care of any life threatening condition, carry out the secondary survey in HHS, which is HHS stands for history. The next one is, um, okay, let me just read out uh, the full this thing in the HHS, which is history, asks about what happened to the uh, the casualty. The other one is the sign check for swelling, the committee, symptoms, how the casualty feels, pain, discomfort, and anything. You know, after helping the person, you have to check out for all of these things. Carry out the health, the head to do examination of the casualty after obtaining consent and putting on your gloves. All right. And do not move the casualty unnecessarily. Then check the head, neck, chest, shoulder, abdomen pelvis, leg, arms, pocket, and then provide first aid as needed. So the next thing I'll be talking about is nose bleed. So our trials are supposed to be as fast, to be, to be fast because of time. All right, so the next thing I'll be talking about is bleeding, minor cut. All right, so um, cut, from our definition here, so cut, cut, cuts can be defined as a break in the skin by a sharp or jacked object. A puncture wound is one made by a sharp object like a nail or a sharp uh, tooth. So what are you supposed to do if you have a minor cut? Because well, this is actually a minor cut, right? And you're bleeding from it. So watch out minor cuts with clean water, dry completely, and then cover with a clean bandage or burn it and antibacterial ointment. Do not apply hydrogen peroxide. All right, so since it's in minor code, it is not advisable to apply hydrogen peroxide, all right, or methylated spirit, uh, as it can cause delay in wounds healing and in some cases consistent bleeding. So that um, hydrogen uh, peroxide, they're just there like a, a antibacterial to fight antibacterial, uh, like an antibacterial you know, to fight uh, against the viruses and all of that. So it is not necessary for you to apply them when you have a minor cold, just for you to, you can apply pressure on it to stop the bleeding, but just for you to wash the, the surface with you know, clean water, then dry the place and uh, you can apply pressure or you have a bandage and also wrap it around it. So deep coat, uh, you apply pressure on deep coat, especially, but the only way you cannot apply pressure on deep coat, maybe that if it happened to be an open injury and it's so wide, what you need to do is just to, if you, can, if you don't have a cloth, try to improvise with anything. But if you don't, you have a bandage, try to wrap it, at least try to minimize the, the flow of blood from that place, all right? Because every individual has about five liters of blood in his body, and it is not ideal to lose that blood, all right? So it is best you try to wrap the place, then take the person immediately to the city, instead of you know, the delay, just take the person to the healthcare um, facilities. So I'm going to do this. Um, so I'm going to talk about nose bleeds. I'm going to do, treat everything about bleeding. All right, so I'm going to talk about nose bleed. Uh, I would like to ask a question, but let me just go with it. So um, the question is, if you're bleeding from the nose, maybe you have a, a direct trauma, and you're bleeding from the, okay, let me just ask a question. Let me just make it again interactive one for once. Uh, maybe you're bleeding from the nose, somebody blowing you from the nose, or you're bleeding from the nose. What are you supposed to do? Let me move the slide so that I see if you not have the answer. If you have the answer, you can just unmute and just let me know. Maybe you're bleeding from the nose, what are you supposed to do to manage a situation? Does anyone have the answer? I should just give the answer and proceed. Okay, let me find the time. I guess known for now. Um, if you're bleeding from the nose, what you're supposed to do is to, you know, 
Um, our parents will tell us, once you're bleeding from the nose, tilt your head backwards so that you will not waste your blood. Yes, it is not good to waste your blood. All right? Like I said, we have about five liters of blood in our bodies, so it is not ideal for us to waste that blood. So, but it is also not good for you to tilt your head backwards, all right? Because the action, the casualty that is bleeding from his or her nose to tilt his head backward, you're actually asking them to swallow their blood. And our system is not made in any way to digest our blood, all right? So the system cannot digest our blood. What you're supposed to do is encourage them to sit down and lean forward, you know? Then if you have, like for me, um, I have my blood on, I can actually change the soft aspect of the nose, right? To change the soft aspect of the nose for 10 minutes. The person can be breathing from his mouth. So pitch the soft aspect of the nose for 10 minutes. Okay, let me just read through the slide. See, if a casualty get the nose bleed, encourage him or her to sit down and lean forward to keep the to keep the blood from getting swallowed because our system cannot digest our blood. All right. So um, you're asking the person to lean, raise his head up, and maybe to swallow the blood to feel a sign like nose acid want to throw up. Right. So you don't want that, that to happen. They should be encouraged to lean forward, right? Once you lean forward, then if you don't have your glove on, you can improvise. You have a clean nylon because it is not advisable to come in contact or get in contact with somebody else's blood. So if you don't have a clean nylon, it is advisable to don't have a clean, uh, don't have a glove on. It's advisable to use a clean nylon or something like that. You know, just put your hand just for prevention, you know, protection. Then hold the soft aspect of the nose while the person is still leaning forward for 10 minutes, right? the person can be advised to breathe through the smell. The reason why you're doing that is to help, you know, the blood to close, all right? Because, and you're also preventing blood to be pumped in that area. The amount of blood that will pump to that area will be reduced and the blood around there will form back later. You know, when a child, when we're a child, you know, when we're young, still very young, once our injury is uh, dying off, you see something like a hairy stuff, all right? So it is actually forming a mesh. The blood will help to form a mesh around that area, like a net or wool-like stuff to form a mesh, and it will help reduce the, the, the flow of blood outside of that particular punctured uh, area. So that is it. Don't advise them to lean backward. They should lean forward and change the bridge of the nose for 10 minutes. But if you have an ice pack also, you can actually use it there, you know, on that area. And it's not advisable to put ice directly on the person's skin. All right. You have a towel, clean towel, just wrap the eyes around that clean towel, then you can place it there. But if you don't, you can just pinch the bridge of the nose for 10 minutes, the, the bleeding will be able to stop. But if it does not stop, you can take the person to the healthcare facility. Uh, just take the person to the healthcare facility for a proper checkup. But try to apply that pressure so that more blood will not be rushing out. Like I said, 10, 5 liters of blood should be. Uh, should be should be safe, all right. Don't try to lose any amount of blood, but that does not mean you should not donate blood. You can as well donate blood without having to get it because you surely regain them, but you should not lose the blood to some extent, all right. So, the next thing I'll be talking about will be choking, all right. I also demonstrate this, but what I'm talking about the choking I'm talking about is not the, the partial choking, there are two types of choking you have the complete obstruction and the partial. Obstruction. You know, with the partial obstruction, where maybe eat fish bone or something like that, got get stuck and you not be able to breathe. You know, uh, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm actually, talking about uh, a complete obstruction where you will not be able to see words, a word. Your 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 air is completely blocked. You not be able to see words, right? Especially maybe you're eating something hard, maybe probably like a meat and stuff like that. And the meat is too hard because you don't want to waste your money, you want to swallow, you swallow you get stuck. What you need to do is, so this is what I'm talking about, this is what I'm referring to, not actually fish bone. But fish bone, you can try as much as possible to like, I don't know, you have to take something hard, maybe like mold paper or something like that and take. But that's not what I'm talking about, I'm talking about um, complete obstruction. So if you have a complete obstruction, first of all, choking, definitely see. It is difficulty in breathing as a result of blockage of the airway or lack of airway. 
In adult, a piece of food often is the culprit. Why young children often swallow small objects like batteries, buttons, etc. Because choking cut off, so, off, cut off oxygen to the brain, administer first aid as quickly as possible. For complete obstruction, you'll not be able to breathe again. And once you don't have this oxygen going to the brain, you see, you, you feel it. Right? So the universal sign for choking is what this man is doing from our slide. You know, placing his two hands on his leg. Now, if you're choking, most of the time, your hand always go here, trying to force the object out, all right? So there can be partial or complete obstruction. So like I said, the one I'm teaching you right now is for complete obstruction, not the, the partial obstruction. All right, so um, first aid for choking. If the person can cough or speak, he's still getting air and is experiencing a partial obstruction. That is when the person can still talk, can still speak, just when it's a partial obstruction, then give advice, do not give back slap, do not give this um, remedy that I'm going to tell you now because the person can still talk, all right? So just encourage the person to try as much as possible to cough out that object, all right? So, but if the person is unable to cough, they are experiencing complete obstruction. So in that case, give five back slaps, all right? If, so, if unsuccessful, give five abdominal thrust, all right? So I'm going to show you how to do that, but I'm coming just to you. All right, um, just want to do something. All right, um, let me share my screen again. Okay, so five back slaps. This is a picture. So you give out five back slaps, all right? Hard, but not so hard, all right? In between shoulder blades, all right? The person has to, have to tilt forward in that direction, not over them, but just tilt forward a bit so that the gravity can assist, uh, assist in you know, uh, bringing out the, the object, all right? So you give the person five back slaps in between the shoulder blades. And if it does not work, you do what we call the abdominal thrust, which is the next picture here. All right, I'll demonstrate that also. And if the person cannot call or speak, they should be. So I'm going to demonstrate how to do that. I think let me demonstrate how to do all of this now. Okay, sure. okay. I think my colleague will do that. Let me just allow me to do that. Just, uh, just the bar. Please. All right, so I'll show you how to do uh, the abdominal thrust. First of all, she will demonstrate five back slaps, then show how to do the uh, abdominal thrust. Okay. All right, so I think we should move. Uh, can I? Sorry, let me see. We are not seeing this stuff in oh, few weeks. No, I should help. Sorry, move forward now. Can you move forward a bit? You're not seeing the. Like here. I see the comment here. All right. Um, I mean, come forward a bit. Yeah. Try to move forward there. No, you're good. We are. Okay. They can be here. I hope you can see it now. Okay. So for you to do, can you see it now? All right. So she had to lean forward a bit. Try yeah, to lean forward. Yeah. Yeah. Don't see if you're choking with your hand on your leg. All right. I see you don't choke. So just remove that. Up. All right. All right. I see you don't choke. All right. So she's going to demonstrate. She'll give her five back slaps in this casual way. All right. So you can either give the back slap. Okay, I'll do that. You can either hit it on her or you hit it as if you're doing upward and forward. You know, hit it upward. She, 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 she wants she to take her hand upward. Or you just give her five back slap hard downward in between her shoulder and uh, leg. All right. So she's going to give five back slaps, but not so hard because her sister here is not actually choking. Right? So she's going to demonstrate how to give five back slaps. Then after that, 
she would do the uh, abdominal thrust very right close to sit. So just give her five marks now. One, two, three, four, five. So the next thing is, okay, let me just show up a bit. They can still stay there. So the next thing is to make a fist, right? I don't know if you can see me, but this is it. You make a fist. This part of your hand, I think I should bring it close. This is what I did, right? Make a fist. This is my hand. And make a fist. Then this aspect of it, I'll put it below the person um, sternum, the breastbone, right? After the breastbone. So you make this fist and just place it there, which is, that is what she's going to do right now, right? Then you, you know, um, compress the person five times as if you want to leave the person up, but you do it five times. You know, with this, with this particular thing, the person will be able to expunge uh, the object, all right? So I think she's going to try it now for us to see. So the person will still remain tilted, but this time around, um, let me see this uh, darker carry is it. Okay, it's not showing it. So what we can see from this other diagram, um, my hand can again, I can't make this. The person's leg will be open, all right? So your leg will be in between the person's leg. But on our diagram here, it's actually not showing, but I'm just letting you know. The person's leg, the casualty legs have to be open. Then you place one of your leg, either your right or your left leg, in between the person's legs, all right? So once you do that, uh, it is just to, you know, uh, take a good, you, like a good stance so that you're not full because if you are standing with your two legs you'll be on the same place once you do the abdominal thrust you can you go down with the person right but you don't want that to happen you have to take a good stance by opening the person's leg put one of your leg either your left leg or your right leg in between the person's leg then make the fist place it below the sternum the breastbone then you give the person five abdominal thrust which is going to go straight right now so one two ready go one so she doesn't want to do it hard because your video is uh, off, please. Oh, my video is off. I'm so sorry. Oh, oh, so sorry, so sorry. Let me go back to it. So my video is not showing. Can you see Anna? Yes, please. Thank you. All right. All right. So, like my explanation said, she opened both her legs, both of her legs. Then she'll make that grip, which I showed you earlier on. Then place it below the stain of the breast hole. Then the casual to get forward a bit again. And she will do as if she wants to leave the person, but she's applying force to the person's stomach. She will, it's as if she's dragging the person to herself and also trying to beat the person. She'll do that five times. All right, so uh, I don't want her to apply so much of pressure on this lady because she is not choking. And I don't know if she's eating, <laughs> she just like it. So I don't want to apply so much pressure, but that is what you do. But on your own, you can try it. Somebody can try it on you and you see the amount of pressure. That you feel on that particular spot. Maybe you can just call on your loved one, your family members to try it on you. But that is just basically, I'm just trying to give you the position. All right. So the person is moving forward in that direction, then push inward and forward. The person will feel the pressure. Just try it on yourself and you let me know you get the pressure. Thank you so very much. So you can also do abdominal thrust. Sorry, for baby, if baby is choking, this is the way to do for baby. You are also advised to give five back slaps but not too hard and uh, baby zone is not abdominal thrust baby is for babies it is called chest thrust the two fingers this time around you don't do double thumb, thumb exciting techniques this time around you have to do uh, the uh, abdominal the chest thrust all right with your two fingers and you place on the baby's chest and you compress i'm sharing my screen now Sorry. Okay, so that is that for baby. Um, but I, I'm going to demonstrate how to do abdominal trust for baby. If you want to do abdominal trust for baby. So if you want to do abdominal trust, oh, let's see, it's so low. Let me see if I can keep myself on here. I hope you can see me on this distance. Okay, so a baby, if you want to do, if the baby is choking, maybe she swallowed gold or battery or something like that, and you're trying to remove that object from the baby's mouth, you have to do that. You have to be seated, all right? You don't have to do it standing. All right, so that's why I'm already sitting. So with one of my legs, I know you will not be able to sit, but let me just try. One of your legs, you have to stretch your leg forward. I see you have to straighten one of your legs. 
Right, so that the baby's head will be facing that way. Like this. So, yeah. let me move back one time just to see. So, you walk on the leg back one time, I see my second position. Not my leg, this is my plan, which is downward. So, if I guess it's like this, why this one is up? You see? All right, so that is this guy. I just hope you can see this. Um, so, uh, the baby's head can be in between my hands, all right? So I place the baby's head in between my hands. And um, his leg in between, I'm going to show you from my slide how to do it, but I just want to demonstrate. I'll show you the picture where I put the or maybe the data to it, or come closer and show you how to hold his head and how to place it in between it, right? So the baby's um, leg in between my hand, and my index finger will be on this baby's face uh, to support the baby's head. So keep it in this direction. Then, uh, so the baby's face will be facing downward with the two index fingers supporting the head. So I give the baby five backs now. One, two, three, four, five. Or you can keep the baby in between the shoulder. One, two, three, four, five. Not too hard. Then you flip the baby. See, with my other hand, I support the baby's head again. Now I flip the baby to the other side of my legs. Right? So once you flip the baby to the other side of the legs, then this time around you shift your fingers. No, but you can actually bring the baby close to yourself, closer to yourself. Look, if the object is out, then try to remove it. But if it's too far, don't try to stick your hand because you can push it further. Right? So what you need to do at this time is to do the uh, abdominal chest foot. Remember for an adult. It is called abdominal thrust, but for a child, an infant, it is called chest thrust, right? So this time around, with my two fingers, I place on the baby's chest, then I compress one, two, three, four, five. And if the object is still inside, I still have to turn this baby. But if I want to turn it again, like I said, try to support the baby's leg because the infant and it's still very dirty, right? Yeah. So support the baby's leg and you flip the baby again to the, to the other side of your leg. That is facing downward, all right. Try to put the baby's leg in between your hands, then turn it to the other side, then give five back slaps again one, two, three, four, five. So you do this in um, three seconds, all right. So in the other three seconds, if the object is still inside, then you have to initiate CPR because as at this time, the baby will be shut off of TG, all right. So you have to initiate CPR because with that object, with the blockage, uh, blockage. The blockage, they will not be able to breathe, right? So you put some and initiate the pair of that. Either using the double tongue recycling techniques or do this uh, compression. Yeah. So with this technique, the object will be able to, you know, come out. That is it for the baby. All right. Um, Okay, so let me check the slide for the next topic. All right, um, so I'll share my slide again. Okay, from our diagram here, you can see the baby's hand is the lady doing the, uh, the, pyro, the, the chest compression and the back slab. She's in a sitting position, all right? So you can see her two fingers on the baby's chest, she's compressing, while um, uh, the baby's leg is in between her hands, all right? Then she can shape the, the back slap. You can see her hand, uh, hand supporting the baby's head from both uh, direction. So just try as much as possible to have that picture upstairs so that you need to initiate it when need be. All right, so um, this is complete obstruction. So the next thing I'm going to talk about is asthma. You may be wondering, does asthma have the first aid for an asthmatic patient? Yes, without inhaler, there's something you can do, but this is not a replacement for an inhaler, right? So you can see this slide. I'm going to explain the various structures, the various things here, right? So um, like I said, the first aid technique I'm going to teach you for an asthmatic patient is not 
irreplaceable for the inhaler. The inhaler is still very, very much important. But what if the person is not with this inhaler and or maybe the inhaler is finished? What is what is supposed to do? Right? So you don't have to leave the person hanging there. You have to do something at least to help resuscitate that person. So your major purpose here is to help resuscitate that person. All right. So if the person is not within an inhaler, it is inhaler. What you're supposed to do is to um, advise the person to sit forward. Okay, but let me explain that diagram first before explaining the first aid procedure to it. I'm going to share my screen again. All right. So from this diagram, this is the normal airway. From the first diagram, there are three diagrams there. One, you can see the, the airway is wide open. You know, it's open, it is wide. The second one, the constriction has started, while the third one, it is so narrow, so small, all right? So that is what happened during, okay, the first diagram is showing you the airway of a normal casualty that is not experiencing an asthmatic attack. The second diagram is actually, um, I'm coming, let me, So the second diagram here, the second diagram here is showing you the airway of somebody that has an asthma. All right. The first one is somebody that does not even have an asthma, a normal uh, human being without an asthma, and uh, that does not suffer from asthmatic attack or something like that. While the second airway there is for somebody that has that sickness. All right. While the last Every day, this was somebody that is suffering from the attack. All right. So as you can see from the first airway, if the person is not is normal, the airway is wide open. But from the second one, it has um, narrowed a bit to that extent. But once the person is suffering from that asthmatic attack, the airway will close. As you can see, the the pathway there is so narrow that the person will not be able to breathe. All right. So let me use my. Uh, I hand to demonstrate that. So let me stop sharing the screen. And demonstrate. Okay. For example, this is the normal, this is the airway of a normal person. All right. Let me come a bit. So this is the airway of a normal person. For instance, all right, wide open as this. So if a person is an asthmatic patient, the airway will narrow a bit to something like this. From being like this to be to come to be like this. Right, so but if um, the casualty is having an attack now, the airway will not narrow. So the space for air to pass is so narrow. So it will be difficult for air to penetrate, to pass through this place. I'll give an example. For example, you are 200 or maybe say 1,000 in a particular room with just one door. Um, maybe there's an emergency outside. There's an emergency somewhere or you are trying to rush out everybody. You know, it will be difficult for everybody to just rush out at once because of the number of people that are trying to come out at that instance. But if you, everybody will be able to calm down and everybody's passing one after the other, you see, the time it will take for them to pass that place will be much better than when everybody's trying to rush at once, you know, to pass that particular place. So that is what is happening during a, when somebody is suffering from asthmatic attack. You know, the person will still try to seek in more air through this small space, and you find it difficult, or the person will find it difficult to breathe, right? And at this point, the, the cells within that place, the airway, the cells within the airway will send a message to the brain, all right? That is, will send a message to the brain, and the message will further, you know, constrict that area instead of helping to dilate it, to open it, all right? So it is best the person does not disturb himself. It is best you know these techni techniques that I'm going to show you right now because the airway is so narrow. Don't try to force in more air through this space. Because if you try to force air, I'm trying to repeat myself again, you try to force in more air through this space. Like I said, you will send signal to the brain to narrow this space. So if you send more signal to the brain that something is happening in this area, the brain will further narrow that space there. You see, the person can just lose consciousness and collapse. You don't want that to happen. Leave it here. 
and do what I'm going to teach you now. All right. So uh, the simple techniques, actually, we do what we call the first lips, first lip breathing. So as if you are breathing through a straw, if you're taking coke or any of these subjects with a straw before, you know, it's so small. So as if you are sipping the egg. All right. So you sip in the egg as though, let me show you how it is in the slide. Okay, first of all, they said, uh, place the casualty at rest in a half sitting position. See this, like the person who sits or lean forward, see so leaning forward onto a table or a chair. Chair back can be helpful. Reassure him, then, sorry, encourage him or her to breathe slowly and deeply. Encourage him or her to use the blue relief in the album. That is if they have the inhaler there. And if it does not work within minutes, okay, I don't think that explanation is here. Let me just explain it. Um, I'll show myself. So you do a sit here breathing through a stroke. That is just it. Have sit in um, sitting position. Then you seek the air gradually, or you breathe in from your mouth and out from the nose. You sit in air as though you are breathing through a stress. I'm actually doing it, I don't even of that. Like I'm sipping air from my mouth, sipping the air, I'm not just taking in much air. So that is just basically, just have that knowledge. So if you have anybody suffering from it, before the attack, just let them know that. Okay, this is what they're supposed to do. If you have this like, like the picture, the uh, pictorial diagram, to show them that this is how the airway will look like when they are suffering from the attack. They'll be able to have the knowledge and be able to, you know, when they are suffering from the attack, sit in more air, you know, sitting generally, like gently, the, the airway will be, the, the cells around the airway will not send that signal to the brain and the cells around that place will be able to you know, open back the time gradually. Right? So that is basically for somebody suffering from one asthmatic attack without using inhaler. So let me check for the next. Let me share my screen. Let me share them. All right, so I call for an emergency, la, 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 la. This one is just an emergency procedure, uh, say. If it is the first attack, maybe the person is suffering that attack for the first time. See, if the attack is called the medicine number, if it is a first attack, if the attack is exceptionally severe, if the inhaler is not working after five minutes, the inhaler should do the work actually after five minutes. But if the inhaler is not doing the work, it's a severe case, that means you have to um, call for or take the patient to medical, for medical, for proper medical check. See, if the attack is becoming worse, Talking, talking is difficult due to breathlessness and becoming um, exhausted. That's when you have to call for, uh, for help. So the next thing I'm going to talk about briefly is bond. I'm not going to dwell so much on bond. And I'll talk about seizures. Let's skip that. I think I'm going to skip that. I'm going to talk about sleep bite, but very, very fast. Just an advice on sleep bite. All right, so I'm going to talk about bones now. Okay, bones are injuries that damage. Bones are injuries that sorry. Bones are injuries that damage and kill skin cells, and are most commonly caused by exposure to flames, hot objects, hot liquids, chemical chemicals, radiation, or a combination of all of these things. All right. So, example of a bone. Sorry for this image. Um, so, this is a small bunch. Just an image. All right, so first aid for bones. I'm talking about, this one I'm talking about maybe either fire or hot water bones. I'm not talking about chemical bones. So, right, so I'm talking about, I'm dealing with fire bones or hot liquid bones. So, what is the first thing you're supposed to do? From a slide, I say, douse the bone area with water for at least 10 minutes. And I'll tell you why you're dousing it with water. 
Then you see, remove any jewelry from the affected area. Cover the bone. Number three says, cover the bones with a sterile dressing. Number four, leave bones to the face and neck exposed. Number five, give fluid if safe. All right. So the reason why they're asking us to douse the area with cold water for about 10 minutes is to help reduce the temperature. All right. Because once the temperature of that place is, is high, you know, the, the degree of the bone will increase. It's as if it's trying to penetrate through the various layers of the skin. So you have to douse the area with cold water to help reduce the, 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 the amount of heat in that area. You know, uh, parents will tell us they can apply so many things. We're not supposed to apply things based on standards, you know, um, proven standards. But we all know that our parents will use different things, maybe only they work. All right, they work. It's not as if they're not working. Uh, they do work, but based on global standards, you know, it is not advisable for us to do that. So now I won't teach you that you can use them, but I think these are things that works homemade. Homemade things that works. All right, so um, that was the area of water. So people use PAP. So and I've also written out PAP. I think PAP will also work, especially if the PAP is in water and it's so cold because of the uh, the density of that part can actually absorb the heat from that place. But because it has not been sensitively proven by so-called global, you know, health kind of people, it is not being accepted yet. So it's something that also works. But they're asking us to just douse the area with cool water to reduce the temperature. And also us to put the area inside the water, just douse it like a rolling water on it. The reason why you're not supposed to put um, your hand inside a bowl of water or something like that. It is because, you know, in physics, they say the heat gain is equal to heat loss, right? Or probably heat loss is equal to heat gain. Reason being, for example, imagine when you want to eat maybe like a hot place of probably rice, or you want to feed your child, your baby and uh, the pap is still hot, you put it in a bowl of water so that the thing will get cold. So they, as the pap is getting colder, the water is getting hotter. So that is probably what will happen here. So if the temperature of your hand is so hot, high, and you put it in a bowl of water, your hand, the temperature on your hand, maybe the bone area, will be reducing, while the temperature of the water will be increasing. That means you're actually not losing any heat, probably, to some extent, because the water will still be hot to affect your hand. So it is best you just douse your hand on the running water to help reduce the temperature. So the next thing here is to remove any jewelry from the affected area. It is advisable to remove, especially if you have jewelry on, remove them from that affected area. But if you should leave it there and go through it. Once you're trying to remove it, you go alongside your, uh, your, your skin. Especially, if you make, for example, if there happens to be a ring, and the place is getting swollen. You know, the ring cannot take another shape. You still maintain the shape. The other part of your as well. While the ring will maintain that shape and it will not be nice, it's not, it will not be a good story to tell. So, it is best you quickly remove any jewelry along around that area. So, the next thing is say, cover, cover the bone with a sterile dressing. If you have a sterile dressing, don't use something like, like a toil. Uh, it's not advisable to use something like a toil because of the, the strain. Once you use something like a toil, the strain will be on that injury. All right. So, don't use something like that. Use something that does not have strain and stuff like that. So wrap that injury if need be. All right. Then leave, it said leave bone to the face and neck exposed. You know, the, the cells in our face are so sensitive that any little thing can cause it to, I maybe mean, it will lead to something else. And something worse than the initial stage. All right. So you don't want that to happen. So bones on the face as a first aider, it is not advisable to attend to it, just take the person to the healthcare facility. So I'm not going to teach you, okay, this is what you're supposed to do, even if you know what to do, but I'm not going to let that out, all right? So just take the person to the healthcare facility, double to the head, maybe the face or the neck region because of the cells, because of that, because the cells around those areas are so sensitive. So it's not advisable to um, actually touch such. Then say give you if necessary, all right? Then things you should not do when somebody uh, as experienced the bone. Say, do not touch the area unnecessarily. All right. 
and do not bust blisters. Don't apply cream like as as made as before, like butter, salt, or any herbs. Just down the areas with warm and cold running water. Then remove clothing stock. Do not remove clothing stock to the bones. Right? There's a story I heard that okay, somebody got down like a hot water to the babies. Right, so the mother was about like trying to remove it also the skin also polluted, which is not a very good story to hear. Right. So it is advisable, leave it. I would have said use scissors, but since you're not trying to do that, if possible, try to take the person to the healthcare facility. They can use their um, scissors to cut through and you know, try to remove the clothes instead of you trying to you know pull the clothes like that. Um, so that is it for that. So I'm going to run through because of time, you guys. I'm going to quickly run through seizures, all right. And there's some other topics that you can also get on our side, which I'm going to talk about. And um, okay, for seizures, seizures, seizures occur as a result of disruption of abnormal electrical activities in the brain, causing an electrical storm within the brain, brain which result in physical changes, conversion. Okay, physical changes. Conversion can occur in sick febrile children. It is not a communicable disease. Okay, seizures is actually not a communicable disease. And it is not everybody that is expressing seizures that is an epileptic patient. But all epileptic patients surely will experience seizures. I don't know if you understand that. It is not everybody that is experiencing seizures that are many epileptic patients. And it is not, but all epileptic patients surely will experience seizures. So it is actually as a result of um, an abnormal activities in the brain that is causing seizures. So it is not communicable. All right. So just give me a few minutes. Just a second. The mic is muted. So sorry. All right. Um, some people experience seizures, especially for babies. Uh, babies experience seizures as a result of maybe probably temperature or something, maybe fear and all of that. All right. Even some adults experience seizures as a result of maybe they are allergic to some things, they are reacting to some things. They can express seizures, but epileptic patients are actually different from those that are uh, expressing seizures. Like I said, seizures, those expressing seizures are, and uh, seizures is not a communicable disease that you should be afraid of. Even the epileptic um, stuff is also about uh, an abnormal activities that is coming from the brain that can be managed, right? So if somebody's expressing seizures or somebody's conversing, you know, checking, what you should do. It is not to try and hold the person to be still in one place because you, you know, or you cause more harm than good. Trying to hold the person, you're thinking of trying to save the person, or some people who advise you put spoon, put this, put that in the person's mouth. It is not advisable to actually do that. All right. So if somebody's expressed express seizure, remember my first statement, it is as a result of an abnormal activity coming from the brain. All right. So it is an impulse, it's, it's triggering some. Um, messages that is causing the person to check. So what you're supposed to do is, maybe the person is checking maybe on the heart, heart surface, it is advisable you look for maybe a soft, if you have clothes, pillow and stuff like that, just put under the person's head. As it's checking, so that you will not, you know, injure yourself. Because this, the head is very, 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 very delicate. So you should not injure yourself. Just look for soft clothes, soft materials, a pillow, put under the person's head, and the person will not um, cause Himself more injuries, right? So that is all about seizures. Like I said, for some people that are expressing it, it is, it is not, it's not that they have uh, an epileptic, it's just because uh, 
Yes, it's, it's just because they are experiencing um, maybe difference in temperature or they are uh, reacting to some things, maybe food, chemicals, or something like that. All right, so stay on the slide. Right. Okay, care and protection, care and treatment. Is it protect from harm? Place something. So if you have maybe something maybe like chair, something that will you know injure that person, what you need to do is to just you know remove that uh, thing, maybe the object that will injure that person. Just remove it so that the person will be able to you know um, will, will be protected, will be safe. Then losing place some. Something so that under the person said, like I said, you can use clothes, pillow, or anything. Lose side clothing, roll into the recovery position. Okay, after the person has stopped checking, you have to roll the person back to the recovery position. All right, so the recovery position is so very important, so much important. For example, you are doing recovery position when you help somebody, maybe after doing chest compression, or somebody that is unconscious and not ready. Once the person with consciousness, you roll them back to the recovery position. Or somebody that is unconscious and breathing, you wrote them to the condition. Or somebody that is expressing seizures, all right? After so much, after checking, just allow the person to check. Because if you try to stop the person from checking, you are also trying to send a signal, just the same way for asthma, uh, an asthmatic patient. Once you are forcing more air to yourself, you are sending a message to the, the brain that something is happening there, and the brain will further, you know, um, try to close that area, all right? The airway. So for uh, somebody that expresses seizures, it also happens like that. If you are trying to rest uh, restrain the person, trying to hold the person, the brain will also get a signal that an external force is, force is acting against it. All right. So the brain will also push in uh, more impulses, and that will make the person to continue checking for a longer period of time than the normal period of time that you're supposed to check. So it is very, very much advisable to just leave the person, but try as much as possible to place soft. Materials on the, on the person's head so the person will not um, enjoy, enjoy himself. You see, we are sure until we are sure until fully recovered. So you have to also give the assurance, right? Because sometimes I'll feel so bad, um, or, or feel down, and all of that. So try to give the assurance to the person to you know to encourage the person. Do not put anything in the casualties' mouths, including fingers. Don't put your hand in the person's mouth because some of them, some people think once they try to open the person's mouth to something, the person will stop. No, it won't stop. It will still, like I said, it is coming from the brain. The only way I think you can actually try to touch a person, especially on the mouth, is when the person's tongue is out. He can check and use his own teeth to cut the stone and try as much as possible to enforce it, possible, to speak possible, fine. Push your tongue inside, but don't put your finger because you can get cut. Do not restrain the casualty which I've explained. All right, so for these symptoms, so I've skipped shock, which I said you can also learn on our website. So um, evacuation techniques, especially happen to be an emergency like an accident, evacuation techniques, something. So I just want to touch on this particular one, this snake bite. I think I'll stop here, then I will introduce our app, which you can get and learn the rest for yourself and different topics there. So, for a snake bite, it's just a minor point. I'm just going to touch to. Um, so, evacuation technique, let me just show you things you can also learn. So, risk of spinal injury. So, this is how to evacuate a casualty if need be. There's a way you evacuate a casualty. You don't just go to lead because you know what to do. So, this is another technique, which is a blood guard, um, blanket dried, and all of that. So, something you also need to learn. But I think I'm not going to go through all of this. Let me just touch this last topic. Um, so we we'll talk about snake bite. Okay, it is often difficult to differentiate between bites from venomous snakes and non poisonous snakes. Thus, it is important that all bites are treated as emergencies as, and given medical attention. So, all bites should be treated as emergencies and given medical attention. So, though it is important to mention that venomous snakes have two fangs that delivers venom when they bite. A venomous snake's bite with you. Right, we usually need two clear puncture. I want you to observe the difference between a venomous snake bite and a non venomous snake bite here. A venomous snake bite will usually need two clear puncture, puncture marks. In contrast, 
Why a non a non venomous bite tends to lead two rows of teeth marks? The other one will come as a puncture, see something hits and you know, but the other one will just leave like two like pinks or something like that of teeth marks the person. But that notwithstanding, treat both as an emergency. So snake bite cause pain and swelling around the bite, and those from venomous snakes because fever, headache, convulsion, and severe enough elastic reaction in some cases. So the symptom is something you can read. Uh, okay, let me just run through it. But okay, let me just, it's there for you to read. So first thing for snake bite, all right? Antivenom is very, very necessary. Seek medical attention as soon as possible. So once you seek medical, and I'm talking about the first thing for snake bite now, allergic symptom. So seek medical attention as soon as possible. Antivenom is the is the treatment for serious snake and venomation. The sooner antivenom is administered, the the sooner uh, irreversible damage from venom can be stopped. See, really, driving oneself to the hospital is not advised because people with snake bite can become dizzy. Pass out and eventually pass out, so it is not advisable to drive yourself as a bus stop in stage. Take a photograph of it if, 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 it's, if it's possible for if it's don't have uh, difficult, but if you can take a, a picture of the snake, it will help the medical practitioner to be able to, you know, they'll be able to identify the kind of snake and know the kind of venom to give us at that time. But if you don't, if you don't have a picture or you cannot discard the snake. It will be difficult for them to know the antivenom to give you because they will want to, you know, sit out of it and try to know the kind of snake, try to run the research and to know the kind of snake that uh, that hurts you and before they can identify the antivenom to give to you. But if they didn't like snake, they're able to tell that okay, this is the color of the snake, this is how it looks like, or the possibly you have a picture of it, or if you don't have a picture, but just be able to describe the kind of snakes and that will help. Loads. All right. So one of the things you should do, like they said earlier, don't drive yourself waiting to get to the hospital in flu. Sit down or lay still and calm to slow down the spread of the venom. Remove rings and watches before swelling starts. So you have, you have to remove all of these things. So position the injury that such that the bite is at or below the level of the heart. All right. So the bite should be maybe if it's on your hand, you don't have to raise your hand up because it will give more time for the venom to travel down to your heart. All right, so say position the injury that such that the, the band will be below the heart. Wash the band with soap and water and cover the band with clean, dry dressing. So one of the things I would advise to do is that um, if it happens to be on the leg, try not to move that part of the leg. Reason being that, you know, the, uh, the amount of blood that will pump to the various organs of your body is much when you're doing, especially when you're doing exercises or maybe you're running or doing something like that. But you tend to stay still, calm, and not moving. The amount of blood flows from your heart to your body will be reduced. But if you are running or trying to walk fast, the amount of blood flows from your heart, because the heart is actually what is pumping out blood in the various organs of the body oxygenated blood to the various organs of the body. So at this time, if you are still and not moving, the amount of oxygenated blood that will pump um, to the various organs of the body will be reduced because as long as you're not having to do uh, more work, the amount of blood being pumped will be reduced, will be so slow. So the time, the time you will take for that blood, the, the venomous or poisonous blood now, to travel to your heart, but once it gets to your heart, that is when the damage begins. To travel, though you can cause damage by moving, because at that point you can start you start swelling. So, but um, it is more dangerous when it gets to your heart, right? Because it can damage your heart and other things. So, the time you take for that venomous um, blood or poisonous blood to travel to your heart will be reduced, all right? So, the the first aid is try not to move that area to slow the movement or the circulation of blood from that bite point to uh, your heart. All right, so that is just it. Just try to give the person reassurance. You will not die because 
if you try to, because, because as a result of you getting scared that something might still happen to you, and you're ready to get to the healthcare facility, you pass in the time in which that blood will get to your heart. But if you try as much as possible to be calm, in an emergency, you have to be calm and show some sort of professionalism. If you are calm, the blood, the movement of the blood to the heart will be reduced, and you tend to save that person's life. If possible, you can carry that person. If you are too, you can help carry that person and all of that, and you help save that person's life. So that is that for that. Um, the first stop, I think, let me see that we have my app down here so I can talk to you about the app. Okay, so um, this is the TISA app. I just want to tell you, quickly tell you how the TISA app functions. Like I said earlier, um, at the beginning, that we are a network of trained first responders. What we do here, we don't just train people and let them go, but it's fine. If you want to be a first responder, want to be part of our network, we can incorporate you to our network. We have a network of trained first responders that are able to help people in an emergency. All right, so most of the time, emergency happens, see people just take pictures, try to upload, and all of that. So as a foundation, we are trying to bridge that gap, whereby an emergency should, have, emergency should happen, be it on the highway, in an estate, even in the barracks, we will have trained personnel there that will be able to help manage the situation. So we organize training, free training, free first aid training, both on-site and online, you know, because we want to have so many people know what to do during an emergency. So you can invite us to come and train you, and we train you on first aid, and you want to be part of our network, you can also incorporate you to be part of our network. And once we train, we train you, we certify you, then you can be on our responder app. We have two apps per se. One is the user app, while the other is the responder app. The user app is open to the general public. Anybody can download the user app. While the responder app is meant for just those that have been trained, not just the nurses, not just the doctors, but those that have been trained and certified, and certified that they will be, they are able to, you know, they'll be able to attend an emergency. We can incorporate them to the responder app. And how this app functions? Function just like the uh, Uber app or the board. All right. How do this app function? Maybe, for example, you need the ride with the Uber. You can request the closest rider will be assigned to come and pick you. But this app is an emergency app. We are not just stopping at having to train people and let them be. We are at the the, the the forefront of having to train people and having to see them help those in an emergency. All right, so that function is that whenever there's an emergency and somebody with a user app requests for help, emergency, emergency medical help, the app will automatically assign that user to the closest first responder there that will come help manage the situation. All right, so remember I said the first 10 minutes is actually the window opportunity for survival. And, and I said also during the beginning of the class that shortage of oxygenated blood going to the brain within the space of five, six, seven minutes. Some of the brain cells will start dying. 10, 15 minutes and above, some of those dead cells become irreversible. So what the purpose of this app is to help buy that 10 minutes of the time before the person can be transported to the hospital. So for example, you request for help and um, the closest person to you, I get a prompt and I'll be able to help attend to that emergency situation. What if the person is not online? Maybe the person that has, maybe, uh, maybe you request for help and you are assigned to a particular person and the person is not online or probably is not with his phone. How are we going to do that? We try as much as possible to answer all of these questions. So what we do is that we also have a command center here in Lagos where we monitor all of these things. All right, from our command center, once somebody requests for help, we also, the person, the, the responder will get a prompt. And from our command center, we also get a prompt. Right, and um, on our app, you have map, you'll be able to see all of these things. Right, no, though not the person in the physical board, you'll be able to see the point at which the person is from our, from our app. Then we can as well, and we'll see the, 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 the emergency, we can as well provide solutions from our own command center here by calling the person and letting the person know what to do because the person will state the emergency situation. Our own work here, we can call. The user, the person that requested for help, and tell the person, okay, do this, do this to help manage the emergency. All right, depending when the the person that was assigned to him will arrive, we can also call the person that was assigned to him and tell the person, okay, hurry this way, you can visit me. And from our app, the person can actually navigate navigate his or her way to 
the, the emergency scene. Because from the app, the app will show the person the fastest route to get to that emergency scene and help the person. All right. So on our app, you will be able to connect to a first responder. Not just that, on this app, you'll be able also to learn about first aid and emergency response. On the app also, you'll be able to um, um, schedule your blood donation exercise. Like I said, we are not just dealing with just first responders. We also have a network of voluntary blood donors. We are trying as much as possible to help the government. And all of these things that we are doing, we don't charge for it, just the certificate. And if you want to be part of an American, if you want to sponsor, you can sponsor our work because we are trying as much as possible to also make kids, first aid kids available to schools, to churches, to mosques, to organizations, so that whenever there is an emergency, at least once we train them, they already have the knowledge. They'll be able to use this, and we can also train them on how to use these first aid kits. I think we'll, I'm going to have a training again maybe sometime. We will train you also on how to use first aid kit, the content in the first aid kit, how to use it. But for today, I'm not going to do that. So, um, train them on how to use the first aid kit. Now, whenever there's an emergency, they'll be able to help, you know, using the first aid kit that they have to save these people. It is all actually for free, right? So, it's not something that they are paying for. So, you can be part of our network as a volunteer, or we also sponsor our work as on what we are doing, all right? So, we also have a network of voluntary blood donation. So whenever there's a need for blood in the country, we're also open to, especially if you're a blood donor with us, just want to check this link in Nigeria, and you're a blood donor with us, using our TCR app, you schedule your you can schedule your blood donation on our app. You know, we have hospital incorporated on the app, so you can locate a nearby hospital on the app, especially if you're a new, you are new to a particular location, you can locate a nearby, a nearby hospital on the app. So um Maybe you schedule your blood donation exercise. Um, you pick a particular hospital. We we'll have the report here on our app that, okay, since you schedule through our app, we we'll have that notification. So whenever there's a need for blood, you request for blood, uh, you're sure to get it as a subsidized rate, though they don't pay for blood actually, but because of the, the treatment process and the separation process that they use, you know, it's actually very expensive. So we need to follow that. So that is what they're actually giving out some exactly support. They are doing it, but because you are coming from us, you come at a very low cost. And sometimes, if you are not able to uh, pay the bills, we can as well to make provision for it for you. All right. So that is basically it. So you can request your blood on our app. You can schedule your blood donation on our app. You can look for a nearby hospital on our app. You can um, learn first aid on our app. You can also request for first or help on our app. And we are trying to incorporate a future like just like WhatsApp, where you'll be able to make a call like a video right now you can chat on the app anyway maybe you 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 request for help and they assign that emergency to me you can chat me up and tell me okay this is something it may not necessarily be you that needs that emergency for example you are a passer but maybe while you're going to work you have the user app and somebody is in need of help you can request for help on behalf of that person what you need to do is just to put the location on the app that somebody maybe collapse or there's an accident somewhere somewhere once you push help the app automatically assigned to the closest first responder in that particular region. So what we are doing now is we are trying as much as possible to have first responder in every location. You can sign up to be a part of our network. Then we know that, okay, you are a responder in that particular region, maybe in the particular state that you are right now. Then we can organize for more training in that place. If need be, we can come on site to train them. We travel on site also to train people, to train people, but the numbers must be very high before you we can travel all right so we can also travel come to your office the organization they have schools people you want to train you can as well invite us we come there and we can come there and we train them on basic first aid and emergency uh response so basically that is it so um the app is actually tcr app the name is there T C E R A. T stands for trauma e stands for care e stands for emergency arrow for response and a application so the app is just there to just make it sound nice, which is this is actually trauma care emergency response application. So if you want to download for now, because uh, for now you can as well download the this user app. If you go on Google Play Store or Apple App Store, you see the this user app and you also see the responder app. For the responder app, even if you download the responder app, you will not be able to sign it because we try as much as possible to put those that we know that 
are able, will be able to you know respond to an emergency on the responder app. So even if you sign, we are the only one that can give you an ID on that particular app. But for, but for the user app, you can sign up and have access to it, learn first, it do all of these features that I said. But now I advise you to download the responder app and take the remaining courses there. And if you have any questions, you can as well ask now or put it on the chat and I'll respond to them or send broadcast SMS or message or email to everybody again on the answers and all of that. And if you want to be a part of our network, you can also let us know through our phone number that we've sent out there. We'll tell you on how we can go through it on it. Um, and also, if you have people who want to train, you can as well also reach out to us. We'll also do that for you. So thank you so very much. Do you have any question that I can answer now? Okay, I do have a question. All right. Okay. Uh, Sorry, can you just read it, please? Okay. Um, before you ask any question, let me. I just want to introduce something to you. Just sorry. Let me just show this. Um, so the band thing. So. So sorry, I just want to introduce something to you for the question. Hope you can see me. All right. So um, we also have. All right. I think we have question first. Let me just quickly take this before the question. So sorry. Um, we also have a book called the Miss Sarah series. I don't know if you can see. It. Okay. So this one is for children. The children are not left out. From our mission, from the beginning when I was defining our mission, I said trauma care is, a, is an NGO with a mission to improve the state of trauma and emergency response services through health education, um, through ed education, advocacy, and community based program. And we also do the child awareness and safety program, school program, school safety program, where we go to schools, try to train them. So the children are not left out, all right? So the children are not left out. So with this book, it's a first aid book. We have series, different series, all right? So this one is actually talking about first aid for bleeding. So we have the one for CPR, how to administer CPR. So even if the children do, do not have strength on how to administer CPR to do the compression, but once they have the basic knowledge, they can as well, um, you know, even teach the, uh, the, um, the parents on what to do, all right? So we are, encouraged, we are trying to push this book into the school system whereby school will be training the children all right on first aid so you can as well also choose to take this to school and stuff like that maybe sponsored by some and take them to schools so it is also available on demand all right thank you so very much so now we can ask the question and what is so you can see it's a comic book and something that children would love to actually you know read Yes, that's thank you very much. Okay, um, my All question right. is on um, electrical shock. Like, All what right. are the um, first aid options um, you All right. provide? For electric shock, you have to first of all isolate the person from the source of the shock. Let me just write the question down. All right, you have to first of all. Um, try to isolate the person from the source of the shock. All right, you're not supposed to be because you're not supposed to throw down the person. And mind you, if somebody's unconscious, let me just quickly cheat the phone. If somebody's unconscious and not breathing, you're not supposed to throw water on the person because if you should throw water on the person, you just the person can lose consciousness. Or actually, though he's unconscious, but you can actually just send the person to a living or something like that. Okay, or even if the person wakes up. It's not as if you're sending the person to any place. When the person wakes up, you have headache. Example is that, for example, you're sleeping at night and somebody just threw a bucket of water on you. You know, once you wake up, actually, if you're just in the middle of the sleep, so you just wake up, you feel headache or feel somehow because he just called you up, uh, called you out of that um, consciousness. You know, if somebody's sleeping, is as good as dead. If somebody's also unconscious, that person is also as good as dead. So it is not advisable to throw water on them. I just thought to cheat that thing. So if somebody experienced electric shock, you're not supposed to throw water on them, all right, because of the charges that is in their body. And the shock is actually affecting their heart also, all right. Depends on 
if the person is still breathing. If the person is still breathing, don't throw down the person. Just try to put them in the recovery position. Maybe after reco fully recovering, that is when you can be positioned for some things. But once the person is still, maybe the person has recovered, maybe the person just shot, you try to isolate the person from the electric chair. Don't throw water, don't do anything. Just put them in the recovery position. They will surely regain consciousness. It's just as, as at that time, they are a bit unconscious of the immediate environment. All right. But if the person experiences that shock and it goes, you know, after isolating the person from that electric from the source, and the person goes unconscious, then you have to initiate CPR. Right? Because, like I said, it is actually going to the shock is affecting the heart. All right. So you have to, because of the, the amount of charges. So you have to initiate CPR, you know, for the heart to be good. But actually, they had to they had to stop pumping out blood. So you have to initiate CPR to actually help resuscitate that person. So that is it. Thank you. Uh, please, do you have any other questions? Thank you. Yes. Hello. All right. You're welcome. All right. Good afternoon. Yes. Good afternoon. Well done for the presentation, and thank you very much. Thank you so um, very much. My, my question is, um, would there be, for those of us now who have attended this online webinar, would there be slide presentation for us, or would there be the recorded version of this webinar sent to our email? Okay. All right. That is why I said earlier on, and I didn't have to even complete it because of time. Like I said, the training, we have, we put together a training video. All right. So we have training video on our app. If there's something, you can go there and just watch it. Right. Instead of us, also, so let's see. We don't give out our slides first of all, but you can go on the app. On the app, you can watch a video of somebody presenting just the same way I'm doing. But this one, the person is talking, you will not be able to respond or ask questions. But it's a video, a training slide that you can actually go online to watch. All right. Thank you very much. But do you know the name of the app? Or I have to send it to you. Well, this is the TCEAR. I think I have the app. The oh. one that you can call for emergency. I've signed up. Oh, oh, is it today or before now? Did you do it today or before now? Yeah. Today. Pardon? Did you do? Did you register on the app today or? Is it today no, it's been there? long. I actually, the first time I I had an encounter was um on LinkedIn. So from there, oh, oh, on it was sent to me. Yes, I got oh. to know about TCIF from LinkedIn. So right. since then, I've been able to join. I've been able to download the app, and I've also been able to sign up. All right. So, but do you know how to take the course? Or you can ask as well. Um, if you don't know, I have my number on um, the invitation I sent. You can at least call me or send this chat, and I'll be able to put you to the step on how to assess the training there. But just for you to click on the menu bar, the menu icon, then you see where the root length first is. You sign up, fill in your details, then log in, you'll be able to assess the app. There are different courses there. One is for the first responder course, course which I think you should take the first responder because it actually uh, it does everything we're talking about. While the other one is just a normal CPR and basic first aid, which we not we did not uh, we didn't talk about everything. But if you want to take the full course, I think you should take the first responder course. But if you have any issues, maybe at the end of the class I can also as well call my, out my number for those that for those that will want to call or send an, uh, an SMS, then I'll be able to, you know, give All feedback. Right. I'll always do that whenever I need any help. Thank you so much. It has been wonderful. Been right, part thank, of you. This presentation. thank you so much. So do we have any other question? Yeah, good afternoon. Thank you so much for this um, wonderful training. It really good, went a long way. Do um, we have any other question? We have good. Should I call my number and call our website for you to actually go there and visit us and see? What we'll be doing and encourage our work as well. And yes. if you want to, we can have yes. for those not in Lagos because basically right now we're in Lagos. What we are trying to do this year is to have different training centers actually all around the country. And we're also actually projecting out outside of Nigeria. We're also reaching out to Africa right now. We're working with different countries. We are working with the Scout Association of Lesotho. Um, um, as a part of Sana, I think, and Liberia, but we're still trying to set up some things there in Liberia. But for now, we're to that into that three countries. Um, trying to also penetrate to Cameroon, but to just set have a center there whereby we just want our network to be there. So maybe you're not in Lagos and you're in other states, 
teraz jo kapos mi bi ja tu jo čo bi ben čo desu ada kan bi spesu spodate no it is not nice for medicine to happen and people just sit just take pictures or um watch what they can do one or two things to help manage the situation i think that would be nice and this training we'll be having this training every month so next month we'll also organize something like this again so for those that didn't participate and they would like to participate next month they can as well thank you so very much they can as well um or if you have friends loved ones you know family members that did participate or people even in the offices school schools and all of that that you want to be part of this training next month we'll also make a post of this again and for now i don't know the time the date but we'll also um, give a particular date because we just want everybody to know particularly when people can connect also get trained again like that for everyone maybe child this year will be for free and we also have certificate for this training we need certificate for certificate come at a cost all right because we are doing it online and we don't want to uh, over cost it all right um come at the cost of five thousand all right so we we'll just do this e certificate which is the online certificate e certificate and you can send it to your email case you need certificate for for the training but before you give a certificate you have to do actually complete the course by downloading and finish you have to finish it on our app because once you download the app and you register for the training on the app we'll get to see your details that and we get to monitor your progress also there and we'll know when you when you uh when you finish the first day we're able to customize your certificate and send to you because we don't just want to give certificates to people that are not knowledgeable on first day that, don't, that are not well trained though it is virtual uh, virtual but at least you gain some knowledge that will be able to that, are, that will be helpful so you can practice it by either if you have a pedo or your on the door baby or something like that you can just practice all of these things and you see like i said the depth is five centimeter you can just get the ruler look for five centimeter on the ruler then try to imagine such while compressing and you'll be able to get all of these things and don't disappear on somebody that is still breathing so thank you so very much and I'll call up my number in case you have any question later or have anything that you would like to discuss with our organization later. We can also organize a Zoom meeting with my organization and we talk to them what you like to execute in your state or wherever you are and what you want to do. All right. Um, so uh, my number is 090 56, sorry, 52. I'll start again 090. Five two five six five six again eight nine zero nine zero fifty two fifty six fifty six eighty nine so that is my number and our website uh let me just call out our website in case you want to visit us and know more about what we do about the blood donation if you don't know you can also develop with us I will encourage you to join with us next to your blood donation on the app. And if there's need for blood, you can be rest assured that you can get it easily when you request on the app. And I'll show you that. Um, okay, so our website is www.traumacareinternational.org. I repeat myself www.traumacareinternational.org. Thank you so very much. I don't know if it's Mrs., but I think it's Mr. Mr. Taiwo. Lua Seven Moses, thank you for your colleagues, thank you for encouraging me. I really appreciate it. All right, so www.chromacareinternationalfoundation.org. Thank you all so very much for connecting. So I hope to get positive feedback from you and encourage your loved ones, friends, everyone out there to connect for this training again to also encourage us and to keep us going and also sponsor our work. Thank you and God bless you. But if you have any other questions, you can send me a chat or you can quickly just get me in. All right, the absence of any other question, thank you so very much for connecting. Do have a lovely day. Okay, I was asking, what is your name, please? Oh, okay, my name, I'm Ken. All right, thank you. Ken, Kenneth, Mr. Ken, uh, thank you so very much. <laughs>